and uh, Ryan. So Ryan mm. grew up in uh, KwaZulu Natal. He's um, he's uh, worked in the in the the field guide of association business. He's a Fagasa guide level three. Um, he tells the most horrendous stories about how he was um, taken out into the bush in uh, elephant country and rhino country and had to climb up trees and the part of learning it and I think he's done the same thing with other people so he's a, a trainer of guys at the highest level. Um, he and Diana, his wife had a, a, a guiding business in KwaZulu Natal. Um, I think the lodge that provided you with most of your um, business folded and, and uh, you just couldn't survive without it. So um, um, Ryan is, is, is now with his um, father-in-law on the farm in Carnarvon, just north of Carnarvon. It's the amazing place where we had the, um, the bio bash a few weeks back. And, um, and I think, Ryan, we just hand over to you and let you tell us about this amazing spot in the Karoo where you now find yourself. Thanks, Ryan. Okay. So you need to share your screen. Yeah, good evening and um, yeah, it's nice to see, I think just about everyone's a familiar face. Um, so hi and uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, let's, let's just start. I think it's the easiest thing to do. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the biodiversity at um, Karoo Plains, which is um, part of the, well, it's on the Louis Vale and Brock Farms where we live. So let's... Um, Get on to that, and uh, just quickly, what are the things I want to cover tonight? Is um, I want to tell you a bit about where we are situated, because it's it's quite um, important in terms of our yeah our unique position in the Karoo. Um, is linked to our interesting biodiversity of that we've found on the farm here, um, and then I'll tell you a bit about our local biodiversity. I'd love to talk about all the taxa that we've found here, but there just won't be time. So I'm going to do some, just some select um, groups. And then um, Les has asked, because I think uh, some of you have obviously come up and done uh, the bio bash here, and have also visited here at other times, and uh, we've been through a terrible drought. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that, because we have had a bit of rain in the last few weeks. So. Um, there'll be some interesting developments happening here soon with that. So, yeah, let's start off with um, where we are situated. So, we are in um, the Northern Cape and we are in the Namakuru biome, which is, a, and we are almost exactly 50 kilometers um, north of Carnarvon um, in the Northern Cape. And uh, there, where that star is, is roughly. Um, our, our location. So we're smack bang in the middle of the Namakuru. Um, and as I said to you, we're on the Louisville and Brock farms, which are working sheep farms owned by my father-in-law. And uh, yeah. So our interesting location is, um, is key for, for the really fantastic biodiversity we've recorded here. And we are actually on a transition zone within the, the Namakuru and we're on, we're situated where the Bush Bushman land and the upper Karoo um, join. So if you, if you can see on the, on the map here, um, 21 and 22, my mouse is, oh, there it is. So 21 here is, this area here is Bushman land and 22 is the upper Karoo. And then uh, yeah, 23 is the Great Karoo. And those three really, are, they make up the Nama Karoo biome. Um, depending what, there's various um, references where some of them will, will actually split this upper Karoo into two sections also, the upper Karoo and the, the, the eastern side they, they call the Grassy Karoo. But that really depends on the researchers and um, the, the maps that you, that you, you look for. Um, I, I quite like the split with the grassy Karoo because if, if anyone's been up to, to Hanover and uh, in that area of the Karoo, you'll see it's, it's a lot more dominated by grass than, than the other parts of the Karoo. But we are situated 
um, right there where that star is, roughly. So we're on the transition line between, as, as I say, the Bushman land and the upper Karoo. Um, so Bushman land's got a lot of influences on our biodiversity. And uh, those include things like the red Kalahari sands, which, which obviously coming in from the north, from the Kalahari, they don't really extend beyond Bushman land. And uh, it's a key aspect of the, the Bushman land habitat. So they are, it's really an um, a interesting, interesting area. And um, also we have sand dunes and dune fields on parts of the farm. However, we are right on the south of, of Bushman land, so, so there's much larger dunes and dune fields further north. Um, but regardless, we have got many of the same species. And yet another characteristic um, habitat within Bushman land are the gravel plains, which are key habitat for birds. For example, the Sclater's lark, which is a yeah, absolute specialist of these gravel plains. And uh, you can get calcrete gravel plains, which are sort of calcrete, sort of a white crusty um, pebble that um, covers vast areas of, of, of this area. It's quite, um, it's got quite a salty soil around that. Um, other areas have got um, quartz uh, gravel. We don't have any quartz in our area. It's a, I see a lot more of it slightly further north into Bushman land around um, Kennard. Um, but we also have the dolerite, which is, tends to be small black or dark brown pebbles and, and um, little rocks, and then also shales. So, so there's quite a mixture of different soils and rock types. Um, and then with the, the, the typical copies, we have um, either tillite or dolerite copies on the top, and then uh, the base of these copies are, are shales. And the Bushman land is also um, a, a part of the crew that has a lot of grass, typically um, stipogrostis, the Bushman grasses. And then, because we're on the transition zone, we've also got a lot of elements from the upper Karoo. So we get the Karoo shrublands, or what out here people call them a bossy felt. Uh, so it's a lot of dwarf shrubs, um, typically in the daisy family and, and, and several others, um, that give the Karoo lamb its, its particular flavor, things like that. But um, the upper Karoo is more noted for a lot of shales, gray and black shales, and then also the alluvial plains, which is sort of um, in the flat lowland areas of the farms where, where we have, it's, it's very silty, sort of very fine soil. And um, yeah, so all of those uh, influences that we get from these two um, parts of, of the Namakuru are uh, help to give us this really fascinating mosaic of soil and habitat types here on the farm. So when it comes to the, the, the actual biodiversity of the farm and, and, and the Namakuru in general, um, it's considered to be relatively species poor when you compare it to some of the other biomes, for example, savannah. Um, this is mostly just due to the, the dryness of, of the semi-arid or semi-deserts. In fact, <laughs> I think in many areas it resembles desert at the moment, true desert because of the drought. But um, it's generally considered relatively species poor. And there are also few, very few strict endemics to the Namakuru. Um, most organisms have extended their range into this biome from other surrounding areas. So such as in that photograph, the sociable weavers, which are more typical of the arid savannah from, of the Kalahari and so on. But they do have extended into the northern parts of, of the Namakuru biome, particularly Bushman land. Um, fauna and flora of the region is, however, highly adapted to this, these harsh climatic extremes that we have here. Um, we had, um, when the bio bash was on, for example, the early morning, about six degrees, and uh, by midday, we were up into the mid 30s. So these animals have to adapt to these really serious temperature um, fluctuations as well as um, rainfall, um, which is wildly variable and uh, particularly low over the last number of years. So, Despite all this, um, biodiversity is quite high in certain taxa, which I will get onto shortly, but um, it's quite noted for some of the, the succulent plants. It's not as rich as the succulent karoo, which is one of the other biomes, 
um, but it's 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 got a pretty healthy um, variety of succulent species. Um, and then arthropods in particular uh, reach quite high diversity out in the Namakuru. Uh, scorpions, uh, solifuges, beetles, grasshoppers, antlions, and flies have got um, some of the are actually so the, the Karoo in the Northern Cape is uh, quite a hotspot for, for most of these groups. Um, that's uh, one of the robber flies that we've found here. So I'll talk to you just now about some of the flies that we have. Uh, they have some quite fascinating ones. Um, so yeah, the Namakuru is actually quite poorly surveyed if, in terms of biodiversity. And um, some of the recent trips out in various parts of the biome have produced a lot of new, well, not a lot, but several new species and um, a lot of um, interesting range extensions and, and so on. So I think there's a, a lot still to be discovered and to be, to be found. I think, um, yeah, we found even just on the, on the bash that we had a few weeks ago, we had um, several interesting taxa that were never found on the, in the area before, a couple of birds. Um, we had the red knot and um, red-faced mouse bird was another that had never been seen here. Um, and, and there were a few others, red back shrike, and um, we also added a couple of um, butterfly and dragonfly species to the list. So I think just the more people get out, the more there is to be discovered. And I think the more we realize how, how rich this biome actually is. So yeah, that brings me to biodiversity on the farm. And as I said to you earlier, I, <laughs> there's just not enough time to talk about every sort of group of, of organisms. So, so I'm just going to do a few select ones. I'm going to focus mostly on some of the more interesting arthropod groups in the Karoo. So I'm going to start with scorpions. Um, we, we have to date recorded 11 scorpion species on the farm. A, a lot of that is due to the Bushman land influence on the Nama Karoo, the, particularly the sand, the red sand that comes, comes through. If you look further south into the Karoo, there's actually a, a, a far less species. The, the, the actual upper Karoo part itself, the grassy Karoo and so on, never, none, there's no sites in those areas as far as I'm aware that have that, that many species. So, so we have a strong influence from Bushman land on the farm with regards to scorpions. So, and it's due to those soil types that we get. So the first one here, I'm just gonna just quickly go through a few of the species we've got. So this one's a Pistothelmus crassimanus, which is um, a typical species of the, the upper Karoo, more, more than Bushman land. But um, it's, uh, it's not always out, but it's, it's, it's always an interesting one to see. Then we have the Pistothelmus carinatus, which is the, the most common of this genus. And it's, it's really our dominant uh, scorpion. Uh, Europlectes gracilio is our commonest species of all. Um, they out almost on every night and in, in large numbers. It's, it's also one of our smaller ones. And then um, Parabuthus schlechteri. We have, um, we have quite a lot, well, I think four different Parabuthus species. This is the most common one. They get quite large and uh, they also seem to come out in a variety of weather conditions where some of the others tend to be far more specific. Um, this one is, seems to be just that much more of a generalist than, than some of the others. And then Parabuthus granulatus. This is the most venomous scorpion in Africa and uh, it's quite a large species reaching around 16 centimeters and um, yeah it's one to be respected for sure. And uh, it's quite interesting is in that we, we typically only find them on windy evenings. And uh, so that's, that's quite fascinating. And when this species is active, many of the other species are not active. So it's, they, they clearly know that the, the, the boss is out on those nights. And then I just want to talk to you about a couple of interesting species we found. So they on the, this one is Parabuthus nanus. This is the smallest species of Parabuthus, or one of the smallest anyway. Uh, it's only a couple of centimeters long. And there's the map. This map comes from Scorpion map on the VMU. And um, that bottom green dot is, is um, where we are. And um, so that's quite an interesting range extension. 
previously they were only known from that Aganais, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, in the northern, far northern Cape, close to Namibia, in that area, also on red dunes. So, so this particular species, we find them very occasionally, but when they're out, they're out in good numbers. And um, also, as I say, on our red dunes. So it's most likely occurs in, in the select places between those two, those few spots. But um, yeah, up until now, hasn't been seen there. So that's quite an exciting species. This is another one that has a quite a similar distribution. Uh, it's also one that we find on the red dunes. You can see the red substrate that it's on there. Um, Parabuthus levifrons, which is quite an attractive species. It's usually this orange or yellow color with black tail tips. Um, it's also relatively small or a bit bigger than Nanus. And then um, this is a, another unusual one which we've recorded here is a Pistothalmus lawnae, which is one of the smaller um, species. That is a full grown specimen there compared to, to my finger. So um, yeah, it's quite a, a difficult one to find. It's not often out, but um, yeah, it's quite a special find. And then that brings me to the spiders. I'm not gonna talk about too many of the spiders. We've found quite a lot, but just a few of the interesting ones. So this one's called the eight-eyed orange lungless spider. <laughs> this is a bit of a mouthful, but um, they're quite common out here. I was quite surprised to find the first one, but um, now that I've found the first one, you find a lot more. Um, and it's, a, it's just a, an, an active spider. It comes out at night and it, it, it does not build a, a silk web to catch prey. So it's an active hunting spider that chases down its prey. And then uh, we have a lot of these, we are probably of a, a few different species. Uh, the buckspur spiders, which are in the family Ericidae, which include all the velvet and the community spiders. So what you see there in the photograph is actually the web or the, the trap that, that the females and the immatures make, um, which is a, a disc of silk essentially that is spun over a, a little tunnel um, and, and the female sort of sits upside down underneath that and as something walks onto that sort of shape like a clover leaf in this case, but sometimes it looks like a real um, animal spur and then um, anything that walks near it, the female senses the vibration and she sort of lifts up the corner and, and grabs it and pulls it in. And then so the females you don't see very often, they, they spend most of their lives in these little um, retreats. But that is the male, which is, um, the males now, it, at this time of the year, we're seeing them quite a lot in the late evening at around sunset. And the males come, um, they run around actively searching for the females and they imitate um, Campanotus ants, which um, obviously are quite an aggressive ant, which uh, makes it quite a suitable ant to, to mimic. So those are the buckspur spiders. And then um, we've also found these quite often, the six-eyed sand spiders, which is a, a, a spider with quite a fearsome reputation um, because in laboratories they've discovered that um, these spiders have got a seriously potent um, cytotoxic venom. However, there's no proof that they've ever bitten or caused any harm to humans. And in fact, we find them occasionally in the house and, and around the house and um, they're very docile and um, uh, they're quite easy just to, to scoop up and, and take, take away and put them outside. So yeah, but they, they sort of half, typically half submerge themselves in the sand and they ambush prey that comes past. And then um, solifuges. So solifuges reach um, their highest diversity in Southern Africa. As you can see there, 22% of the world's species occur in South Africa. Um, and of those 81 species have been recorded in the Northern Cape, making it a, a hotspot for for these creatures. Um, so this is just a few of the select species that we found. So, or groups, um, I've not really found anybody that's able to identify these two species. So, so the most we get is to family or, or sometimes to genus. So this is one of the biggest ones. This one is really a huge species. It's a very intimidating, imposing looking creature when you get close to it. 
um, and very, very fast. Um, and we found them so, so large that the abdomen is about the size of a chicken egg. Um, so they, they're really massive. And this is on the opposite end of the scale. This is a tiny little one from the family Gallipidae, which um, these ones seem to be associated with termites. And um, they're around the size of termites too. And um, this one was attracted to lights at night. Probably I don't know, feeding on ants and termites around the, the lights. And there's another group here, the Blossia. It's a very long, elongated solifuge. Um, and then this one is the Chelipus species. It's one, commonly known as mole or teddy bear solifuges. And they, they are more typical of Bushman land than the rest of the, of the Karoo because they, they, they inhabit sandy, um, soft sandy soils. Um, hence the name mole solifuge. They, they do like to, to burrow. And they're quite small. You can see that below it is actually a dried um, pellet uh, sheep dropping. So it was quite a, a little guy. And uh, they, don't, they don't look particularly scary. They're quite um, cute in a way, I guess. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, sorry, moving swiftly on, um, because I think, um, I don't know how much time I've taken up already, but um, the, the next group I would like to talk about is just the, the robber flies, or flies in general, are particularly diverse in the Karoo. Um, not just the common sort of, um, turd flies or whatever you want to, to call them, but we have a lot of the other interesting groups of flies that are, are um, particularly robber flies. The, the, the Karoo is particularly rich in that. And this particular one is called Despletus vespertilio, um, which is a, a very special find because um, it's interesting in a number of ways. One of them is that it's uh, strongly sexually dimorphic. So this black one you see is the male. And this is the female. And um, they were also previously only known and only recorded from that far northern Cape near Aganes on the Red Dunes. And then a, a few years ago, I found one and I, I sent it off to, to, to someone to get identified. And uh, it turned out to be this species. So it's quite a serious range extension south. And um, it's interesting also in that it only flies for a couple of weeks in the beginning of October. And um, no, no, no longer, oh, never recorded after that. So it's got a very, very small window of activity. And it's quite large also. Um, sort of um, several, um, it was about four or five centimeters long. Um, it's quite big for a rubber fly. And then um, this is another interesting fly that um, I recorded on the BioBash with Rick. And uh, we found this on an area where it's um, very, very salty. It's on, in a river and uh, it's really um, some sort of a salt river, essentially, and white salt crust. And this is an apiocerid fly. We initially thought it was a robber fly, but it, it isn't. And it's, um, it's quite, it resembles a robber fly. Um, robber flies are, of course, um, highly predatory, whereas these are actually, the adults are pollen or nectar feeders. And um, the juveniles or the larvae are suspected to be um, predatory. And so they're quite rare. There's actually only three species in South Africa. And from what I've found, um, the references that I've come across um, mostly recorded from the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape. And uh, this, so this is now quite far up into the Northern Cape. So it'd be interesting to, if somebody was, would be able to actually get an ID on this one. And then um, this is another interesting fly we found. Uh, it's an unidentified tangle veined fly, very large, uh, made a very loud buzzing noise. And it's got a fantastic long proboscis like that, as you can see, and um, really interesting thing. And I've only ever seen two, and both times on the same um, plant, the Lyceum, uh, honey thorn. And um, yeah, really, really interesting creature. Um, yeah, and bee flies is another group of flies which are um, quite common in the Karoo and they are very biologically diverse out here. Um, or every time we go out and I look at these um, little flowers, particularly Missembranthum um, species, you find these guys and they're always active in the middle of the day. Um, and there's, there's so many different types. It's, it's quite f 
fascinating to, to see them, but they're actually very important pollinators in the, in the Karoo. Um, one of the most important pollinators and um, so the adults are pollen nectar feeders and the, the larvae are, are um, either parasitic on eggs, pupa and larvae of many insects and uh, or predatory in fact so they're, they're quite important um, control agents for, for pests particularly grasshoppers and so on um, and as you, uh, many of you may know grasshoppers can be serious pests in the Karoo. So, so these are quite a, a beneficial insects. Here's another species, another one. Um, they're always typically very fluffy looking furry flies. Um, yeah, really interesting. And then we also have Midas flies, which is another group of mostly rare, quite rare flies. They resemble rubber flies, but they, they actually, the adults are also pollen and nectar feeders. And, uh, but they do quite closely resemble rubber flies and um, very seldom see them. And when you, I think, I suspect they probably come out to coincide with flowering times for certain um, plants. Um, so they, they seem to have also very small windows of activity. And there's another, another one that we've recorded. And then um, another group, which is um, very um, biodiverse in the Karoo, are antlions and lacewings, um, Neuroptera. It's a group I've quite recently got into, and um, I'm really passionate about trying to record as many as we can. Um, so this is one of the ones that comes more from Bushman land than from further south. And um, it's also characteristically associated with the red sand dunes. It's a very large species with a wingspan of around 12 centimeters, 120 millimeters. And um, yeah, they often attracted to the lights. This is a, a, quite an attractive species, very common at certain times of the year um, with very intricately patterned wings. Um, the Samothals illustrous, I don't know the pronunciation, but the, the tree hole antlion group. And then um, Pulparis immensus, this is one of the largest species in South Africa. It's even bigger than the Golaphrus I showed you just now. Um, also often comes to our lights and um, yeah, really uh, um, an impressive and good looking antlion, I think. <laughs> and then yeah, Centrophesis maligna, another interesting species that's, that comes through. And I think we have currently had 23 or 24 species identified and um, I've got another hundred odd records waiting uh, identification. So I'm hoping we'll add quite substantially to our uh, species list on, on the antlions quite soon. And then uh, another very interesting one is Pulperidius capicola, part of the hook-tailed antlion group. And you can see that strong, powerful hook at the bottom there, um, part of the, the bottom of the abdomen. And yeah, they're also quite common at certain times. This one we see more in the late summer. They haven't come out yet this year. And um, yeah, we also, um, just to, before I finish off on these, um, we've recorded now 22 species of, of Odonata, dragonflies and damselflies on the farm. And uh, this is just one example of it. This is the, the red basker. And you can see the, the furthest little uh, record on the, on the map there to, on, the, on the left, that is on the, sorry, on the right. And, but the, the furthest record on the left of the picture um, is our spot and this, so it's quite well out of range. And um, so we've had several interesting species of dragonflies which have turned up on the farm, particularly after thunderstorms, within a day or two of thunderstorms. We've, we've recorded this one, the red basker, um, ringed cascader, which is a species of running water, streams and rivers, rapids. So, so what that was doing out here, I don't know. But also straight after thunderstorms, um, I'm assuming they're just following these storms after breeding. For, 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 for the rich food supply. And uh, we've had many others like the Black Emperor and so on. So, so I think 22 species for a place where we have very little permanent standing water is quite, quite amazing. Yeah, so I, as I said to you, I just don't have time to talk about all the taxa. Um, so just a select few this time around, maybe on another 
time I can get into some of the other creatures. But um, yeah, so moving on just to the last bit here. Um, some of you were up here for the, the bio bash that we've had recently. And uh, yeah, you've seen firsthand the ongoing drought that we, we are experiencing here. The, this picture was taken just a few weeks ago during the bio bash. And as you can see, it's um, really, really desperately dry. And um, our biggest concern here being on a sheep farm is that many of the bushes have not recovered um, and, uh, are, and are in fact dead. And yeah, it's a, it's a huge worry. It, it does appear, it's, we've, we did have a little bit of rain um, a couple of weeks ago now. And um, that's what it, we had 75 mils in, in about 45 minutes. And uh, it was extremely localized rain. It, it, um, several kilometers away, it had um, only about seven mils. And um, the top of the farm at Brack only had uh, 20 mils. So it was a very isolated, um, massive thunder shower just um, yeah, in one part of the farm. And in fact, the far south of the farm hasn't had any rain for three years. And so, so yeah, there's a bit of an issue at the moment, I chose the farmers are quite concerned. The rain is extremely localized and um, yeah, it's, so everything is still in the balance here. We, in terms of the drought, we, you know, it, it looks like a fantastic 75 mils, but uh, it was so dry beforehand. It's also, and because it's so dry, there was, it's caused quite a lot of damage to the felt and the roads in terms of wash away um, of topsoil and things like that. So. Yeah, it's um, the drought is just um, yeah, it's it's a big concern still. But some parts of the farm, as you can see, I've had some relief. But that was a f the the, road, the the whole farm, the center of the farm flooded, and um, the water was about a meter deep. Last it lasted about um, five or six days, and then it's, it's if you look out there now, it's actually bone dry, almost no sign that we had any rain whatsoever, and then. Um, yeah, so you can, the last picture I think I've got up here um, is what it, that first image I showed you um, that was taken during the bash, that's what it looks like now. So the only things that have really started to recover is the grass and um, a few of the bushes. But actually, as you can see, it doesn't look like some of those, uh, the majority of those bushes have survived. So that's our biggest worry out here at the moment with the drought is that... Um, it's how much of the of the, the plant life has survived the drought. Yeah. And um, some parts where there's been grass, the grass is starting to recover. And as you can see, this is a, this is a part of the, the the previous photograph was actually in the on one of the gravel plains. So so it is naturally a very arid part of the farm. And uh, this this is actually a, a area where we've got the alluvial soils which um, in this, this area collects a bit of water. So we've got a lot of grass cover there, but you can see into the distance now, those bigger bushes on that alluvial flats that um, they've started to green up now. So, so the whole farm is not um, in such a bad shape as that previous um, picture I showed you. So yeah, we, we're quite excited. We're very grateful that we got this, this shower, but um, as I said, to very isolated rainfall and um, it's not, not covering everywhere at the moment. And um, we hope for some more. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a picture of what it should look like um, taken several years ago. And yeah, thank you. Right, thank you, Ryan. That was, um, that was awesome. Yeah. Are, there, um, are, there, are there questions for Ryan? I haven't looked at these questions for Ryan in the, in the chat. Um, Itosa, can you look if there are questions for Ryan in the chat? I haven't seen any. Yeah. No, no, I haven't seen any either. There are some comments, but no questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Ryan, does anyone have a question? I don't mind answering some questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so this this is um, Louis Valfol. We had a, a bash there. A few weeks back, as so I've got some questions about both. I think there's some questions coming through here now. Yeah, Les. okay, go for it. Um, if you can actually, okay, I see one. Um, bullfrogs, we do have, we've had um, 
last year we, we recorded our first um, giant bullfrogs, um, large numbers of them, but all juveniles. We never managed to spot any adults. And um, yeah, so I think when I, I remember looking in the, on the VM for, for records of or previous records of bullfrogs from this area. And um, in fact, most of this whole upper Karoo Bushmanland area, there were only historical records. So yeah, but they are around at the moment. We've, we've had a few more uh, juveniles out. Um, yeah. Um, hi, uh, Christian. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you there, Steve. Hi. Um, what else? What else? Any other questions? Mm. I was asking okay, about um, the stinger, the scorpion. Scorpion. Yes. Um, so I believe it is quite a, a dangerous scorpion, and it, there are um, fatalities recorded from it, um, particularly in parts of the Northern Cape. So it's definitely one to to be careful of. Um, I've, I've uh, Lady Doctor, off. yes, I, I would have liked to have spoken about a few, a few more of the the, the taxa, and Lepidoptera is definitely one of the, the interesting ones. I just didn't have the time, but um, hopefully on another another presentation I can talk more about that. But we we added um, a handful of species over the biobash recently, and we've had some also some very interesting vagrants wandering into the area, such as um, I'm trying to think now the the twilight brown was was one, um, and, and and several others. So so. It's, um, and, and also interestingly today, we had um, a little butterfly migration coming over with the pioneer caper whites. Um, just suddenly thousands and thousands of them, but um, it, it, it only lasted half the day and, and um, then they were gone. So uh, yeah, but very interesting. And I'm hoping now that we've had the rain, we're gonna start getting some, some additional uh, interesting records. Yeah. And Excellent, Ryan. Thank you very much. Are there, are there any more questions for, for Ryan? So, uh, so we, we are delighted that uh, Louis Vale is now Zoomable. And um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think Ryan has uh, demonstrated his uh, Zoomability <laughs> too. So we'd, we'd love to have you back to uh, talk about all these other things on the, um, on the farm. Thanks, Ryan. That was superb. Thank you very much. There is, there is a Thank last you. question about where, about the location of the farm. So maybe I don't know if you have like a website or something where you can share so we can. See. Um, yeah, we actually need to get our website back up again, but um, okay. it, I've it, I let it slip over the last um, <laughs> couple of months. So we'll we'll get that all up and going again. Um, but yeah, um, so I didn't see the the question. Was it about our location? What is the said? farm? Is the question just before the lepid up there? Sorry, say again. From, from Jackie. Where is, where, where, where? Asking, where is the farm? Okay, now we are in the Northern Cape and we are 50 kilometers north of Carnarvon um, in, in the transition zone between um, the Upper Karoo and Bushmanland. So quite far, quite far north in the, in the Karoo. And about how many kilometers from Cape Town? 600? 500? Uh, well, it's about a six hour drive Six six and a half hour drive coming up the west coast and then in at um, Calfinia, so yeah, it's it's it's, it's a fair way up. 